2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, a familiar passage. It's where uh, the Apostle Paul, he's speaking to Timothy, and he makes this very powerful statement. He says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Now, when Paul makes this statement to Timothy, um, he's making it to Timothy in a, in a very particular context. Now, generally, when we uh, look at this verse, um, uh, we apply it in terms of our fears in general, and it definitely is worth applying it in that particular context. But Paul, he is writing to Timothy, his spiritual son, who was the overseer of the church in Ephesus, and there were several dynamics that were taking place in the church of Ephesus. If you recall, in Acts chapter 21 and 22, Paul had said goodbye to the elders at Ephesus, and he had warned them about these wolves that would come to the church of Ephesus that would devour the people. And it looks like, as Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, uh, these, uh, these teachers, these wolves, these leaders had crept into the, uh, uh, the, the Ephesian community, so to speak. And Paul is writing a letter to Timothy um, to, to encourage him and to say, hey, Timothy, uh, stand strong. Don't be intimidated by what is happening. Don't be intimidated by um, these false leaders, these false messengers who are coming into uh, the community of God. He says, don't be intimidated. That's why he says, God is not giving you the spirit of fear, but he's giving you power. He's giving you an anointing in your life. He's giving you the spirit of love, which we'll look at that in just a few moments in terms of how to gently deal with these situation. And he's giving you a sound mind. In other words, he's giving you the grace of God on your mind so uh, to not lose your clarity and to not lose your conviction in the face of these arguments that these leaders may bring. And beloved, we are living in a time where 2 Timothy 1.7 needs to be a stand to the forefront of our minds, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, uh, that we don't have to be intimidated by the false ideas that are emerging within the body of Christ, the false ideas that are emerging um, in the culture, but that God has given us a spirit of power, and there's various dimensions related to that power. He's given us the spirit of love, and there's various dimensions related to that, and he's given us a sound mind where we are able to uh, maintain clarity of truth and of the grace of God and the gospel in the midst of growing hostility in the culture. And so paragraph A of page one, uh, we are living in a time uh, when spiritual and social political or social and political pressures are mounting. And all we have to do is look at the last 20 years, and it just seems to be just picking up more and more just in different ways. In a lot of ways, this has been going on for a while, but in my opinion, in some ways, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the attack in September 11 was, uh, was, a, it was a marker, it was a mile marker um, in American history and in the history of the world. And lots of things have begun to change um, in this country and in the world uh, since that event. Uh, when it comes to America specifically, in a lot of ways, uh, uh, the, uh, the country has been vulnerable to, uh, to military and, and terrorist attack and balloons. Okay, and, uh, okay, I got to sneak that one in there. <laughs> in the last uh, 20 years, you know, the, um, uh, this, you know, the whole sense of economic instability, um, as well as the severe moral decline that is happening. Uh, there's growing confusion about the grace of God. There's a growing presence of a different gospel uh, that has crept into the church. I think of uh, uh, Jude, Jude chapter 4. Jude makes a very interesting statement. He tells the, the church, uh, Paul tells Jude, he says, certain men have crept in unnoticed. Certain men have crept in unnoticed. That these uh, false ideas of the grace of God and of the gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about another, he talks about a different Jesus. He talks about another gospel. And there are very subtle ways that these things creep in 
um, into uh, the, the community of Christ. And so these things are happening, and they're, and they're very, very serious in their implications. Now, in, uh, in, in Peter's first epi- uh, paragraph B, in the first epistle of Peter, 1 Peter, uh, he talks about a judgment coming against the house of God first. Um, now, with, again, within the context, it is important to understand that what, what Peter is referring to is he is bringing an interpretation of the social pressures that were happening at that time in the Church of Rome. Uh, one of the things that had, that had happened was that there was a tremendous persecution that broke out against the church. Uh, there were some things that the, the Roman government actually did to, um, uh, to cast suspicion upon uh, the Church of Rome. And so not only was the church, not only was the government uh, uh, persecuting the church, but the, uh, all of society became uh, very suspicious uh, to the church. And, and, and Peter calls that uh, uh, God's judgment against the house of God first. And, and what he's referring to there is that, is that these pressures were actually designed to, to purify uh, the church of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, he talks about the household come being under judgment. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, he talks about our faith, which is more precious than gold and silver, uh, being purified by, uh, by the fire of these social pressures. And I believe that it is very important that as things are continuing to emerge, uh, and we've all said this, that, you know, uh, you know, September 11 happened, but in here we had the whole pandemic. And we've all said it, that, that there's a new normal that's being established, that we're not going back to where things were in 2019. We are not, and it's obvious that that is the case. And so we're, we're on a whole different trajectory, and uh, there are different, again, different trends socially, uh, spiritually, psychologically. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that, uh, that are emerging. And it's important that we, as the body of Christ, not only interpret these things in light of the sociological trends, but that we actually interpret them through their prophetic lens. For instance, in Daniel chapter 7, it makes it very clear that the Lord is the one who releases the four winds of heaven on the nations and is creating a stir. The Lord is the one who is ultimately, yes, the enemy's involved and the sin of man is involved and all that qualifier stuff, but God himself is directly involved in shifting the global landscape because he's getting the people of God ready uh, to be prepared, to be trained, uh, to rule and reign with the Son of God um, in, uh, in the age to come. And so it becomes important that we, uh, that we learn how to interpret these trends, not just through the lens of the culture war, but that we also learn how to interpret it in terms of, okay, Lord, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to us? And, uh, you know, I got a little uh, snarky the other day. Surprise, surprise. And uh, it was right around the time when, you know, there was all this stuff going on about all this classified documents being found and whatnot. And, and uh, people are going, man, you know, uh, why aren't these people being more sensitive with sensitive information? And all I could think was, yeah, but how many times have we been insensitive with sensitive information that's been shared with us by others. Okay, so, <laughs> right, it's, it's, we, it's having to interpret the, in, um, uh, the, the social trends through a prophetic lens because part of what the Lord is doing, he's purifying his church. He's purifying his church. And so if we only view it through the lens of, of the culture war, I'm afraid that uh, we will run the risk of walking in self-righteousness. That is not to ignore the culture war. But Peter says that these social pressures, they are actually designed to purify the church because judgment falls in the house of God first, referring specifically to the social pressures. That's how Paul defines it. And so uh, Peter defines it. And so the, the social pressures that are emerging in this nation and in the nations of the earth, they are designed to, to purify the church. They are designed for us in our own personal lives to be in asking 
some real deep questions about, Lord, what are you saying to me? In what way? I may not be participating in that expression, but, and, but how I might participate in the spirit of that expression. Paragraph C. The social, political, and moral pressures are causing, again, many in the body of Christ to reevaluate the worldview, uh, their spiritual perspectives, uh, their understanding of who Jesus is, um, his, his glorious gospel. In other words, the, the, there's a foundation that is being exposed in us to, to, see if it's the, if, to, to see if it is the right foundation, if it's the foundation that is laid uh, through the gospel. Paragraph D, so it's essential that we examine our faith uh, to see if it is the faith of the apostles or is our faith according to the culture or our political preferences or uh, whatever sin that we've decided to cling on to, letting that be the thing that guides our understanding of our faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, and I want to be very careful what I'm going to say next because I... Um, I'm not saying this to, uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this body. I don't believe this to be true for this body. I'm only mentioning this um, as, a, um, as a teaching point uh, so we can differentiate some verses. For instance, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, uh, the apostle Paul says, he says, examine yourself to see if you're the faith. But then in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, he says, look, he says, I don't even examine myself. He says, the Lord is the one who examines me. And what's important to recognize is that when in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, that is the posture of the unfire believer. The posture of the unfire believer is that the Lord is the one who examines. So Psalm, 1, uh, Psalm 139, Lord, would you search my heart? Lord, would you know my thoughts? But here in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul is not contradicting himself he is talking to a community of believers who are in profound danger of abandoning the faith because they had begun to embrace another Jesus and another gospel, and which is why Paul says, he goes, you know what? He goes, you need to check yourself to see whether you are of the faith. He goes, test yourselves. And uh, we are approaching those days where many are going to need to examine themselves to see if they are of the faith, whether they are according to the litmus test as found within the context of the word of God. Paragraph E, as things continue to unfold to an end time climactic end, the greatest battle before the church will be the battle for truth, both inside the church and in the context of the public square. It'll be the battle for about the truth of Christ, who is the truth, John 14, 6. It'll be the battle for the truth of the word of God, which is truth, John 17, 17. Your word is truth. And Jesus made it very clear in Matthew 24, uh, verse 4. He says, um, he says, see to it that no one misleads you, or see to it that no one uh, uh, deceives you. I, I believe highlighting the primary burden, the primary concern of his heart for the end time generation, which is, the issue of truth. And uh, right now, there's all kinds of things happening with the truth. And now it's no longer the absolute truth. Now it's according to your truth. And I'm going, wow, okay, how did that happen? There is, there is singularly the truth, and it's, and it's the truth of Christ. And, and we want to line up our hearts with that reality according to God's word. So what is our hope? Our only hope is to give ourselves to the word, paragraph F to live in it, to, uh, to abide in it, to obey it, to meditate on it. And this will allow us to stay faithful to um, our assignment as Christians, as well as give us a, an, a clarity to have uh, tranquility and boldness in the midst of pressure, uh, to have courage to love tenderly and the power to break through the satanic fog that is on the minds of Many, and so Paul, speaking to Timothy in in, uh, in Second Timothy, uh, one seven, he says, "Therefore, he goes remind 
uh, I remind you to stir up the gift of God. And I think that part of what the Lord wants to do in us, I mean, not just tonight, but just in a, you know, in this upcoming season, he wants to remind us to stir up the gift of God that he deposited inside of you and me. Each, each and every one of us as believers tonight, there is a deposit of God's grace, the gift of the Spirit that is inside of us. And Paul tells Timothy something quite unusual. He says, Timothy, part of your safety in the midst of dangerous times is by actively engaging in the gift of the Spirit that God has given you by serving in the midst of the body that you're a part of. Because the gift of the Spirit, the way that it operates, the way that it manifests, it actually manifests by serving. You know, uh, I'm not going to do this by show of hand right now, but I'm certain that some of you here who have a prophetic gift didn't realize you had a prophetic gift until someone told you you had a prophetic gift. You're just talking, saying stuff. You know, praying for people, knowing things you shouldn't be knowing, not even realizing that you didn't know it, but you just, it is just so clear to you. And finally, people start coming to you and say, hey, you've, you've got a gift. But, but the way that they saw the gift was you actually put yourself in the way of serving people. Your gift will make a way for you. Again, the way the gifts of the Spirit manifest in our lives, whether they be prophetic gifts or healing gifts or teaching gifts or leadership gifts, administration, whatever they are, they manifest in the context of serving. And I find it interesting that part of Paul's exhortation to Timothy, who already was the overseer of, of the church of Ephesus, Paul says, I want to remind you to stir up the gift that is inside of you. Stir up the grace of God that's inside of you. There's so much more in you, uh, Timothy, that the Lord put in you. I remind you to stir that up. He continues, he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. And a part, a part of, I'm sure what was happening was Timothy was being tempted to draw back in the operating of his gift as a leader over the church of Ephesus in the midst of all the different dynamics that were taking place. He says, because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. In other words, the, the anointing to, to break through whatever needs to be broken through. The spirit of love, the ability to endure. That's what I read when he thinks of spirit of love. He's, he goes, the ability to un endure under pressure by continuing to remain kind and thoughtful and all the, all the qualities of, uh, of love. And thirdly, to have the anointing of a sound mind where there's clarity of thought that comes your way. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we may touch on it a little bit, a little bit just a few moments, Right there in the notes, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Um, Paul, talking to Timothy, he tells him in chapter 3, he says, look, he says, Here, here's what's going to take place. Here are the, uh, the conditions that will take place at the end of the age. But then in verse 16, again, a very famous verse, all scripture is, in, is, uh, is given by inspiration of God. And again, the scripture usually gets brought up to uh, highlight the authority of scripture. And yes, it is highlighting the authority of scripture. But part of what Paul is telling Timothy here is that, Timothy, the only way forward in the midst of these unsafe times or these perilous times is by giving yourself to the word of God. He says, because God's word is profitable. He said it actually is useful and it is able to thoroughly equip the man and the woman of God for the works of righteousness. And so giving ourselves to God's word, um, and you know, how, whatever he gives us grace to, that really is the only way forward. So turn to page three. Excuse me, page two. Some of you got excited. Man, I'm out of here. Nope, not yet. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Raining in. <laughs> Okay, Paul's final pastoral instructions to Timothy in the 21st century. Paragraph A, the, uh, 
the second Timothy is an, it is an urgent letter. I want to give us a little bit of context for second Timothy. It, it's an urgent letter. Uh, from Paul to his uh, spiritual son. Uh, Paul, he wrote 13, uh, 13 epistles. And 2 Timothy was the last one that he wrote before he died. Uh, Paul had uh, two journeys into the Roman prisons. He'd been in jail many times, but he spent, he had two tours in the Roman prison. This is the second one. And while he's in a Roman prison, the Lord makes it clear to Paul that he's, that he's come to the end of his race. And so uh, he writes this letter to, uh, to Timothy. As I mentioned earlier, when Paul said goodbye to the, the elders in Ephesus, uh, he had prophesied to them about the coming of these, um, of these wolves. And now the time had come that what Paul had prophesied, that what Paul had warned them about, had actually begun to happen. And it come to the point that Paul was here in prison and he makes one of the most, uh, one of the most intense statements that Paul makes, in my opinion. He says, all of Asia has left me. He said, they've all left me. He said, they've all written me off as being off the wall, false and foolish. Now think about this. Here Paul has labored for decades in ministry, he's about to die, and all the churches that he has touched is that they had all left him. And Paul is writing this letter with urgency uh, to Timothy, urging him to uh, to hold the line. He says in chapter, uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, he says, I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. Now, Timothy was someone who was very near and dear to Paul. Paul says in Philippians that he had no one that had a kindred spirit like him. He called him his beloved son, Timothy. And so the, so the, so the times are urgent, and Paul is probably writing this letter to probably the most important person to him in the natural in terms of, in terms of a person that he cared about. Now, the... Uh, the nature of, of urgency, paragraph B, is not that we become frantic, but rather urgency is about, uh, is about priority. It's, it's about focus. It's about being determined uh, to give ourselves to the primary and to, and to the foundational things. And that's what Paul is doing here in 2 Timothy. He is writing this urgent letter um, encouraging, Paul, uh, encouraging uh, 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 Timothy to, to stay the course, to continue to prioritize and to focus and to be determined on the main things. And 2 Timothy, I believe, uh, contain, uh, 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 it consists of, do I like to say, it consists of forerunner qualities. There are forerunner qualities. There are things that Paul highlights for Timothy in 2 Timothy that are pertinent for us today. Go to paragraph C. In uh, Paul's day, there were several um, contributing factors uh, to the urgency that Paul was feeling. Uh, one of them actually was there was a, um, uh, yeah, I can say this way, right, there was a rise of anti-Semitism taking place um, in Paul's day. Uh, things were really stirring up um, in the Roman Empire and ultimately, in 70 A.D., um, Israel, Jerusalem got uh, got surrounded by the Roman soldiers, and Jerusalem got uh, got invaded. And so, there's this growing sense of of anti-Semitism that was taking place um, in, uh, in in the Roman Empire, which is why Second Timothy chapter uh, 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 two verse eight, uh, <laughs> Paul says something quite amazing. To I, I says one of my favorite phrases. He says. To Timothy, he says, remember Jesus Christ, the seed of David. Remember Jesus Christ, the seed of David. In other words, it's not just Jesus, it's the Messiah. It's not just the Messiah, it's the Messiah who came from the seed of David, the Jewish king. He connects Christ with his Jewishness. 
And so that is one of the anchors that more than ever we are going, the Lord is going to help us to connect with that more than ever, the Jewishness of Jesus as anti-Semitism will reach eschatological heights before the Lord returns. Remember Jesus Christ, Paul tells Timothy, the seed of David. Later on, he talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he talks about the social pressures that will amount, that will arise in his day, but they will really arise in our day. In the last days, there will be perilous times, Paul says. And he gets, and we're gonna look at that in just a few moments. He gives 18 uh, components of what these perilous times will actually look like. Thirdly, the church is under a, a, an apostate siege. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 to 5. All kinds of distortions about Christ and his gospel. And again, that's the context in which Paul tells Timothy, hey, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but it's given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Power and love and a sound mind to, stay, uh, to hold the line on the identity of Christ. Power, love, and a sound mind to hold the line on the, on the truth of the gospel in and through the church. Uh, power, love, and a sound mind to, uh, to be a witness in the midst of perilous times as he gives the conditions of them in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And so Paul, he calls him to, an, um, uh, to hold the line. In paragraph E, the purpose uh, for which Paul writes to Timothy is to, it's to give him courage. It's to give him courage as a Christian, to give him courage as a leader or a shepherd, and to give him courage as a messenger. He calls him an evangelist in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, do the work of an evangelist. Preach the word. So he's calling him to, again, to courage. Just as a believer, as a leader, as a messenger, uh, to hold the line in three areas. Number one, his personal life in terms of his personal pressures. And there does seem to be this thing that Timothy had this thing related to fear. And Paul is saying, look, he says, don't give in to this whole thing. Some of you have heard the, the saying, Tim Timothy, that this was something that he probably struggled with. Secondly, uh, to hold the line corporately when it, came, when it comes to uh, false teachings concerning the gospel and thirdly, to hold the line in society because he talks about perilous times. And so he calls Timothy to, uh, to stay the course personally. He calls him to stay the course, course uh, uh, corporately. And he calls him to stay the course socially. Now, um, in, uh, let's see here. Paragraph F, in this hour, the Holy Spirit is calling us, I believe, again, to hold the line in these threefold areas. Personally, when it comes to holiness. Corporately, when it comes to loving one another. And that's, not, and that, that's in this community, but that's just for the whole body of Christ, that we learn how to love one another. And socially, that we would be a loving and tender witness to the gospel. To hold the line refers to courageously, steadfastly hold the position in battle, which is why Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.3, he says, Timothy, be a good soldier. We are not to give up ground in the spirit in relation to the truth of the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I'll say this again. We are not to give up ground in the spirit related to the truth of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ. Paragraph H, in the first chapter, Paul gives Timothy two very specific ways for him to hold the line, to hold the line in message, intimacy, and ministry. And here's what he tells him in verse 13. He goes, guard the message. Guard the message. Beloved, if, if there's ever a time where we are to guard the message of the gospel, it's, it's today. Guard the message. 
There are, you know, I, n- I never thought I'd sound, sound like, I would start sounding like an old guy, but no, no, bro, that was way too heartfelt of a laughter. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I was telling uh, some of our IPU students the other day, you know, the things that are happening today in the name of Christ after 30 years of walking with Jesus, it's unthinkable. I never thought I would see the things that I'm seeing today after, you know, three decades of being with the Lord. I mean, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the signs of the great falling away, they are right before us. It is ever a time for us uh, to hold the line and to guard the gospel, Jude, contend earnestly for the faith, Paul told Jude. It's today. I'm not talking about picking a fight. I'm not talking about just, you know, going on Facebook and getting into all kinds of arguments. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where we hold the line in our personal lives. We hold the line corporately in the way that we love one another. And there is that tender, resolute witness in the church, and to those in the culture. So here's what he tells Timothy. Guard the message by studying it, obeying it, instructing in it, and confronting with it. Studying it, obeying it, instructing it, and confronting with it. Secondly, He tells them to guard the mandate. Guard the mandate by being faithful to the assignments. Go ahead and turn to page three. The call to endure in ministry and message in dangerous times. In 2 Timothy chapter three, verses one to five, Uh, Paul says that there would be perilous times. He used a very haunting word to describe the times that we're in and the times that we are approaching. He stated that these days are perilous, which means that they are hard to take. They're hard to approach. They are difficult to bear. It also means that they are troublesome, they're harsh, fierce, even savage. That's what it means for uh, these days to be perilous. I I, I realize that this is um, a bit heavy, but but we've got to look at these things, beloved, with, with eyes wide open. We are in the beginnings of perilous times, And the peril will only increase. We're we're not going back to to the yesteryears. And I'm not just talking about America. I'm talking about the earth. We're not going back to the yesteryears. That which was spoken of in the scripture, these days are upon us. And Paul gives us 18 components that describe this peril. Each one of these components, there's 18 of them. If we look at each one of them, when they come into full maturity, it will be absolutely unthinkable, the implications of these 18 components. I mean, narcissism coming into full maturity. Lovers of money coming into full maturity. I mean, when Paul talks about lovers of money, he, he told us, he told Timothy in the previous book, he goes, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And so the love of money coming into full maturity, what it tells us is that the evil that will emerge will be unthinkable. Paul calls it perilous times, dangerous times. Savage, the beastly, he says. 
He says there will be boastful, arrogant, revilers, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. In other words, just absolutely refusing to settle differences, refusing to forgive, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal. But I want to I want to draw our attention to one that um, Lord help me. But I want I, wanna, I I feel like I need to highlight this. He says, "For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers. Here it is: disobedient to parents." Here's what's interesting. So what's interesting is when we look at the scripture, the scripture likens the disobedience to parents as the shedding of innocent blood. And so whereas we've been contending for the shedding you know, for the ending of the shedding of innocent blood, as we should. There is another component that the scripture likens unto the shedding of innocent blood, Leviticus 20, verse 9. Disobedience of parents. Ezekiel 22, verse 6. He lines up the issue of obedience to parents with the issue of the shedding of innocent blood. But who would have thought that from heaven's perspective, the growing of the disobeying of parents, that that is something that actually defiles, will defile the land. It's something that we're going to need to take some real serious look, uh, a look at. It's the subject of disobedience of parents. The prophets spoke about it quite strongly. Paul continues, they'll be treacherous, their whole betrayal culture, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And so what is happening here is Paul is describing the conditions in which we are to hold the line. His exhortation is relevant to all believers because all believers are in Ministry of some sort. Whether a student, a marketplace, a parent, government official, etc., we're all called to hold the line and message, mandate, and ministry. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, Paul describes the hallmark of New Testament ministry as something that is strengthened in grace through intimacy and by laboring together to make disciples. That the grace of God is roots in our lives in an increased way as we give ourselves to two things. We give ourselves to intimacy with the Lord and we give ourselves to the labor of making disciples. And by making disciples, I don't just mean you know, street evangelists. I'm talking about where we're making disciples within the context of the body of Christ. There's two ways that disciples are being made. One, they're being called to follow Christ. And then number two, they're being called to obey Christ. And when we give ourselves to intimacy with the Lord and laboring in discipleship, there is a strengthening of grace that comes to us. There are three meditations that Paul gives Timothy that would give him insight into how to steward his assignment. He tells him, he says, Timothy, he says, think on these things and may the Lord give you much insight. He says, number one, he says, consider the soldier. What is the point of a soldier? Well, it's one who is single in focus uh, and the purpose of fulfilling the mission that's given to them by the commanding officer. 
singularly focused on fulfilling the purpose given by the commanding officer. Secondly, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, consider the athlete. And, uh, and what that's referring to is that this life of discipline and trained to play by the rules, namely the word of God. Consider the soldier and consider the athlete. The, uh, sorry, I just had a personal moment, forgive me. But uh, I, uh, no, the, uh, uh, you know, one thing that I've tried to do in my life is I love studying about the military because of this verse. Paul says, he says, consider the soldier and may the Lord give you insight into this. I love studying about the athlete. I used to be one. The older I get, the better I was. You know how that goes. <laughs> But <laughs> there's some up and coming ones, whatever. So anyway, I love, I love looking at the life of athletes. It, it gives us insight. And uh, I've been kind of asking myself, okay, Lord, what about the farming thing? That was, that was my personal moment here for a second. But the hardworking farmer, diligent in the mundane, embracing the process, knowing that a reward comes from the Lord. So again, so the soldier is singular in focus, number one. The athlete is trained to, uh, uh, to live by the word of God, and the hardworking farmer has the grace of God to be diligent in the midst of the mundane, embracing the process, knowing that in time the Lord will reward them. Paragraph C, Paul continues, and he presents to Timothy truths concerning the beauty of Jesus that promote effective ministry, the various faces of Jesus. But here Paul specifically, you can look at the verses later, he, he, he uh, presents truths about the beauty of Jesus to promote effective and enduring ministry. These truths also highlight, uh, are highlighted uh, regarding to God's faithfulness to Israel. Verse eight, he is the, the seed of David. It talks about his suffering and the true grace of God. So have the worship team come up. Lastly, paragraph D. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, what Paul does is absolutely amazing. He instructs Timothy on how to instruct gently, patiently, yet resolutely confronting those who teach wrong ideas. Gently instruct, patiently, yet resolutely. In other words, not drawing back. Doesn't have to have vibrato, but just staying the course, not drawing back, confronting those who are teaching wrong ideas about Jesus and the gospel through doctrinal error. He then climaxes his exhortation by urging Timothy to stay strong in the truth of the word. He says God's word is sufficient to inform. It is sufficient to equip us. And it is sufficient to keep us steady in the storm. I'll say this again. The word of God, Paul points Timothy to the word. That's why he says what he says in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. He says, you, however, Timothy, continue in the things you have learned and, and have become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. Beloved, this is the word for some of us. Continue in the things that you've learned. Continue in the things that you've been convinced of. That is the complete opposite spirit of this whole deconstruction thing that's going on out there. Paul didn't say go and deconstruct. He said continue in the things you were convinced of. You continue in the things that you've learned. And here, I love this. He goes, 
and know who you've learned them from. Some of you learned these things from your parents. Strong, godly roots. Paul tells Timothy, he says, remember, remember the roots. Some of you may not have come from a strong Christian line, but you've had strong Christian mentors in your life. Paul says, remember who you learned them from. You know what their lives are like. You've had a front row seat to the pressure that they have endured and how they stayed steady in the knowledge of Christ. You've seen the challenge that they, that they have faced and they continue to grow in love and truth and wisdom and kindness and tenderness. He goes, remember the people that you learned these things from. He goes, don't go on a deconstruction tour. He goes, no, actually continue in the things that you've learned, the things that you uh, were convinced of, and remember who taught you these things. And that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings, Paul says to Timothy, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. For all scripture is by the inspiration of God. All scripture is profitable. It is useful for the training and to thoroughly equip the man and the woman of God for the works of righteousness. Let's stand.